So, welcome to the afternoon session. I'm Makoto Tsubota, chairing this session. The first speaker is uh, Professor Parika. Yeah, Please. thank you. Uh, so, let me start by thanking the organizers for this wonderful meeting. Uh, so, the title is a bit provocative, uh, large is different. Uh, what I'll try to do is, so at least in this meeting so far, uh, people have discussed systems which one could broadly think of as Newtonian systems or systems in active matter, which, uh, and then one tried to understand them with either aspects of field theory, but all within the standard premises of homogeneous isotropic turbulence. Uh, what I'll try to do today is point out to you two systems, which I have been looking at for quite some time, namely bubbly flow and polymeric turbulence, uh, where what we have, or, or what I'll try to tell you is that how presence of small amount of polymers or bubbles dramatically alters uh, not only the, you know, the uh, underlying flow configurations, but the nature of the turbulence itself and certain new scaling regimes, which were at least not explored so far, uh, thanks to, you know, the big simulations that one can do now. We have figured out their new scaling regime. So there are things which at least we would like to propose to experimentalists to uh, uh, you know, venture into, because both these problems actually are driven mostly by experiments. So let's start. Uh, okay. So the part one of the talk is going to be about bubbly flows. And this work was mostly done by Vikash. Uh, who was a graduate student at TIFR and is now uh, uh, doing his postdoc at Nordita. And these are some of the publications where it has come out. Uh, but let's uh, look at the problem. Problem is very simple. Uh, think of the you know, aquarium next time when you go to any place and you have bubbles which are rising. Uh, that same situation happens in variety of uh, situations, whether it's geothermal vent or boiling or in bubble column reactors. And now you could ask the question or think of these bubbles as moving obstacles, which is moving, which are moving through the fluid. And as they move through the fluid, they churn the fluid. And now you could ask a very simple question. What is the statistics of the flow fluctuations in such a simple scenario? Is it similar to grid turbulence? Is it different from grid turbulence? Because naively, you know, one could think that these bubbles are nothing but solid particles, which are moving through the fluid. So if they're large enough, you can think of them as you know, systems which generate some turbulent wakes. And then naively, you could think of this as a moving grid. And so the turbulence that is generated should be like homogeneous isotropic turbulence. And that was in some sense what we felt, but we were wrong uh, because indeed, you know, people have looked at this system with fair details. And this is one of the experimental setup from the group of Detlef Lose, uh, where you have a tall, uh, tank and you have bubbles which rise uh, through because of buoyancy, uh, they, could, they also had a moving grid by which you could in principle also impose turbulence. The size of the bubbles is fairly moderate, two to five mm bubbles. But you know, in, as we are doing fluid dynamics, it doesn't make sense to talk about just the numbers per se, but to look at the non-dimensional numbers because they are more relevant. And the num non-dimensional numbers that would be relevant for us would be because of the buoyancy, the ratio of buoyancy forces to the viscous forces, that's the Galilee number, the bond number, which is a ratio of buoyancy forces to the surface tension forces, and the Artwood number, which describes you what is the density difference uh, between the two phases, right? The bubble phase and the liquid phase. Uh, for air water system that one typically studies, uh, the Artwood number is 0.999. So, you know, the density difference is very large, of course. Uh, the bond number is typically of the order of three to five. The Galilee number, is typically of the order of in experiments, 300 to 400. Um, and then, you know, with all these numbers, you could ask what kind of flow is created. Now I would like you to look at not the left part because this phi third appears because they have a moving grid. I would like you to concentrate on the right part of the spectrum. So if there were no bubbles present, the spectrum actually falls off fairly steeply. On the other hand, if bubbles are present, the spectrum raises and you see something like a minus three scaling. Uh, now this was not first pointed out by this group, but actually much earlier um, there in 91, there were these interesting experiments done by Lance and Batal, 
who pointed out, who also observed the same thing. And they had a very simple theory for this. What they pointed out was as the bubbles are rising, uh, they generate wakes. Uh, these wakes are immediately dissipated in the vicinity of the bubbles. So you are thinking of a Stokesian-like balance. Whereas the bubbles rise because of buoyancy, you are injecting something. And at the same scale, the thing gets dissipated by viscosity. And then, you know, if you do a naive dimensional analysis, you would come up with the answer that the energy spectrum then should scale as k raised to minus three. These spikes are just the bubbles. No, so these spikes are in the Newtonian thing in their experiment. So it's not clear to me why in their experiment at these very large scales, they have these spikes at 10 raised to minus three. This is experimental uh, data. So this, this part is not clear to me why. So this B is equal to zero is single phase Newtonian uh, liquid. Uh, but in the Lance and Batal thing, so it's, you know, the argument was fairly simple. And for a long time, the community believed that this indeed is the case. However, you know, you, from the turbulence that you know, and the system that you're looking at, you might wonder that why this should be the case rather, why the nonlinear transfers are not important, the fact that the bubble can deform is the deformability of the bubble irrelevant in these systems. So, you know, those were the kind of questions that we are looking at. And also one more thing, the moment you see the spectrum, you already start to wonder that, you know, in such systems is there. So when we think of homogeneous isotropic turbulence, we have this idea that there's this phi third regime where energy flux is constant and then things fall off it's exponentially fast in the dissipation range. But if you have bubbles, would you have a dissipation range similar to what one thinks in conventional homogeneous isotropic turbulence, or you would have something different? So these were the kind of questions that we are looking at, uh, or we wanted to understand. And in, one thing to remember is that even in these experiments, the Galilee numbers that one was looking at were around 300 to 400, all right? So let's go ahead with this. Uh, now, why did these uh, Lance and Batal made the arguments the way they did? Was that they didn't have at least measurements to look at two point correlations, but they made a very, let's say, decent guess where they said that they expect, now these were the numbers they put in were all through guesses most of the time, that the, in their system, the dissipation time scale is comparable to the production time scale but it's much smaller than the nonlinear time scale. Now the question is again, can one check it through a good numerical simulation, whether that is indeed the case or not. And unfortunately, no one after the, their paper had looked at this, like even the more recent works of, uh, from the Tlev's group, group didn't check this explicitly. So, so then we, when we started to look at it, we were, you know, you look at all these non-dimensional numbers and then you are worried that if, we are going to do a study, mostly numerical, uh, to understand this flow. Is it important to be in exactly same ballpark range as experiments, or it's okay to be far away? And then the phenology that you develop, whether it will be applicable to experiments or not. But you know, you, you have to start at some point. So we started off with a very simple case where we assume that although in real system, the density differences are very large, we'll assume the density difference are small because that allows us to work in the Boussinesq regime. But we ensured that our Galilee number and the bond number were in the same regime as experiments. And then we hope, like every physicist does, that anyways, we are going to look at the collective behavior of many bubbles. So maybe there are universal features which will come about, uh, which don't depend on what density contrast I'm looking at, but we'll see whether that's correct or not. So the so I'll come to that in a moment. But the, the easiest way would be that you think of the bubble diameter divided by the rise velocity of the bubble. That's one of the estimates of the buoyancy time scale. Yeah. It it depends on the Galilee number, but it's it's for a single bubble. If you're thinking of an isolated bubble, so it's not again clear when you're looking at a suspension of bubbles whether that's the appropriate estimate or not. Right, because things would interact with each other. But let's go ahead and let's see what happens. So let's first think about what happens for an isolated bubble. Uh, and you know, as you are, so there have been very, you know, detailed studies of bond number, Reynolds number, how, what are the bubble shapes, where does one lie, and everything. And fortunately for us, 
most of the experiments lie in this regime where bubbles are mostly ellipsoidal. All right, so bond numbers which are order one or here close to, yeah, somewhere here. And the Reynolds number, uh, which is order 1000, which converts to Galilee number around 300 or 400. But interestingly, what one sees if one looks at the Galileo fluid motion of Van Dyke, that you know, as you go on increasing the Reynolds number, the wake of the bubble itself can get turbulent. And now, therefore, you could imagine or think of a numerical experiment at least, where if you go beyond where experiments go and crank up the Galilee number of the bubbles, what kind of phenology will you observe? Ah. No, it's not, but I'm just pointing out that the wake looks turbulent. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. So I think it's based on the bubble diameter. That's my guess, but I need to cross check. No? So it's based on the rise velocity of the bubble, the diameter of the bubble, and divided by the viscosity of the fluid. Um, and, and the fluid changes, but that doesn't matter so much. Uh, so you know we will attack this problem numerically, and the way we do it is uh, somewhat in an all-out attack with all the possible numerical methods that one knows of. And we would like to compare different numerical methods. The reason to do it in this way was the following that there are variety of, I mean, this is a problem which is fairly challenging. There are different approaches. And unless you can show that all approaches give you at least somewhat quantitatively similar answers, you would always be worried whether what you're getting is consistent or not. So as I pointed out to you earlier, our earlier studies were at small output numbers. So there we were using a pseudo-spectral code coupled to a front tracking algorithm. Later on, we also started to use the second order finite volume solver Paris. Uh, more recently, uh, Riday, who has recently joined our group uh, with Luca Brandt and others has incorporated a, uh, a volume of fluid algorithm into this code. And we have used all these codes together. So all the data I will show you would have spectrum and statistics from all these different codes lying together or different so that you know you can yourself gauge how good is the quality. Um, so, but these are essentially the equations which are fairly simple. Uh, you have that the carrier phase or the concentration or the indicator C gets advected by the flow, the fluid, the hydrodynamic velocity is incompressible. You have the modified form of the Navier-Stokes equation where the density itself depends on the composition, whether you are in the bubble phase or in the liquid phase. The viscosity also depends on the composition. Uh, we assume a simple linear form of combination of these two cases. You could think of more complicated combinations of how the fluid, like, you know, mu f by c plus mu b divided by one minus c, but it doesn't matter. And what we'll do is we'll try to solve these equations numerically and try to see what kind of results we get and then analyze them with different methods. The first step indeed was to look at single bubble trajectories and indeed what we found is what is reported earlier that as you keep on cranking up the Galilee number, at small output number, the flow structure changes, but you know, the bubble has this wobbling kind of motion. As you <coughs> increase the Galilee number, the bubble wobbling decreases, but then it makes this meandering right motion with a horseshoe vortex, uh, which is shed behind it. And you could again wonder therefore that if I take a collective behavior of these particles and looked at the flow that they generate, whether there is something universal or non-universal, right? That's the question. And here is a picture of what happens if you look at number of bubbles together. Uh, on the left, you have the low atwood number. On the right, you have the high atwood number. And you see as the bubbles are rising, they deform, they generate some flows, these flows interact with each other. If you look carefully enough, you would see that at output 0 0.04, the bubbles are indeed oscillating, whereas over here, the bubbles are making meandering motion. And then, you know, they generate some kind of a mess behind them. And the question is, what is the flow statistics of this mess? Can we understand it with the kind of knowledge? Here, yes. Yes, 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 yes. In both the cases. So they never coalesce, but that's not an important. So we have also tried with the volume of where the, but, but there's a reason for that. And I should have mentioned it. That's an important point that these systems 
all the experiments are at volume fractions which are 5%. So you have you know the fact that bubbles will come close to each other is fairly rare. So therefore we are fine in you know even assuming no collision of bubbles. All right, but their wakes interact with each other and the wakes are fairly long. So that's a very important point. You can make. So, okay, let's go ahead then. Uh, now you could ask the question, which what every, you know, every time we do Navier strokes, we should ask that, okay, you have a system of these rising bubbles. What is the kinetic energy balance? And the answer turns out to be very simple. You have rate of change of kinetic energy plus rate of change of surface energy is equal to viscous dissipation plus injection. Right, this is the balance which you would expect. Remember, if you are in the steady state, both the kinetic energy and the contribution because of surface energy would go to zero. And that's an important point to keep in mind because when you are going to look at, let's say, scale by scale energy budget and other things, this should come out clearly at the largest filtering scale. Right, so that's one thing to remember. And what you can check very easily is that, you know, the balance is fairly nicely satisfied. And one indeed gets a statistically steady state. So now we are well set to ask ourselves the question. So what is the statistics? How does the spectrum looks like? Are the results consistent with the experiments or not? So let's uh, look at that. Uh, oh, before that, let's also, uh, so let's first look at that. So this is what we did. We plotted the energy spectrum as a function of Galilee number. And as you keep on increasing Galilee number, from something like 100 to 300, you start to recover the experimentally observed k raised to minus three spectrum. Uh, more recently, thankfully for us, there were other groups who could do Atwood number of 0.99 and it looks like all the data falls on top of the minus three scaling that we have. They took actually our data and imposed on this. Uh, so that's good. We are recovering the experimentally uh, observed thing. More interestingly, what uh, one of the referees suggested to us was to look at the time series of the data, plot the frequency spectrum, and why don't we compare the frequency spectrum that we are getting with the experiment. So here is the frequency spectrum that we found from our numerical simulations. And on top of it is the experimental spectrum, and they also are overlapping with each other. So at least it's clear to us that for what concerns the velocity fluctuations, there seems to be something universal, which doesn't depend on the artwood number that we are looking at. And all these systems seem to suggest, which are not only done by us, but for others, uh, other people and also experiments, everyone seems to fall together in one place, showing you that indeed the energy spectrum is showing the minus three scaling. More interestingly, even if you look at the velocity fluctuations, they also seem to agree with experiments. So here is a probability distribution of the horizontal velocity fluctuations. <clears throat> so there are some departures at large separate, sorry, at large velocities where we think or we believe that's happening because of the wake structure, but the core, you cannot distinguish between experiments and simulations. More interestingly, so this one were only till Galilee of 300, more recently we have gone all the way up to 1000. And even if you crank up your Galilee number, the core of the PDF seems to be all together, very close to each other. And they have some kind of a exponential decay, at least in the core region. Right. So with this, let's then ask the question, what is the origin of the minus three scaling? And then because we are in a field theory talk, we, one would like to use a method which is similar to field theory. That is do a course, you know, some kind of a coarsening of the system at different scales or what is known in the fluid dynamics community as a scale by scale energy budget. And uh, I mean, one could use spectral filters, but we believe because, you know, our system has a bubble phase and a liquid phase, it's better to use a Gaussian filter for smoothening. So you could define the filtered velocity field and using the standard tricks of Ink or Boru and Orza, get the Reynolds stress tensor, strain tensor, and from there find out what is a nonlinear energy flux and eventually end up with a steady state flux equation, which tells you that the nonlinear flux plus the transfer because of the surface tension should balance viscous dissipation and injection because of gravity. So with that, let's see how does the data looks like. So this is the plot. The green curve data is the injection because of gravity. So you see that because this is a cumulative plot, if you want to see at what scale is the injection happening, you have to take a derivative. So you straight away see that the injection for the bubble saturates around the bubble diameter. The dissipation is happening at much smaller scales. And this gap 
that you have, there has to have be a nonlinear transfer. So the original idea of Lance and Batal therefore needs to be modified. There has to be a nonlinear transfer, which takes care of the energy transfer from these scales to the dissipation scale. And what are the candidates? You have the nonlinear transfer because of the flux and the surface tension term. And quite remarkably, so the blue, which is a small blip like thing happening here, is the nonlinear transfer. And the red F sigma is the surface tension transfer. If you add them up, you get the total transfer. So surface tension absorbs energy at scales which are larger than the. So, you know, as the bubble is rising, it deforms, and that's where the surface tension is absorbing energy. And then it's pumping back energy into the fluid at smaller scale. What is the exact mechanism? We haven't pinpointed it, but you know, there are possible candidates, capillary waves. As you know, the bubble undulates, it injects vorticity into the system. Uh, and we have some simple calculations which show that. Um, and then that balances viscous dissipation. Uh, what should be the form of this curve? Well, again, you could use the same kind of argument like Lance and Batal to say that the production should indeed have a form which goes as K inverse. And if you plug it in and actually you balance it, you indeed find out that the net production or the net transfer because of the surface tension and the nonlinear term balances the viscous dissipation to give you the minus three scaling. So that's quite interesting because that then explains the observed minus three scaling and the result is because of the nonlinear transfers, which were earlier not known. But you know, then you could look at the spatial distribution of energy flux, but in view of time, let me go ahead. Let me look at the more interesting bit. Now you could ask the question, what happens? So till now, what we did was we tried to work on systems in parameter range, which were consistent with experiments. So now you could ask the question, what happens if you go beyond the experiments, what happens if you can, if you do numerical simulations where Galilee number goes larger than thousand, what physics do you get? Is there certain universal behavior or not? So that's what we started to do. And here are the snapshots of the flows generated by the bubble as you go on consistently increasing the Galilee number. You see the bubble wakes are getting more and more violent and they are interacting with each other in, so if you, I gave you a snapshot, it might be very tempting to say that it's indeed a turbulent flow, right? But then the question is that, is it a turbulent flow or not? And so let's look at the spectrum that is, yeah. What's the intuitive so it's the ratio of buoyancy forces to the viscous forces. So you can think of this as the Reynolds number in the system, because the buoyancy force is a large scale force and the viscous is the small scale. Therefore, as I'm increasing the Galilee number, it's effectively like I'm increasing the Reynolds number of the system. Yeah. All right. So, so then let's ask, how do the velocity fluctuations look like? And here, what I've done is I've plotted all the data that we had from various methods for different Galilee numbers on a single curve, scaled it in a way in which, you know, typical turbulence scaling is done. And what you find out quite remarkably that you indeed have a phi third scaling which appears. And that's followed by another regime where you have the pseudo turbulence minus 3.3. Now, what is psi? So, psi is the Kolmogorov like time scale which you can construct, which is nu cubed by the buoyancy, the energy dissipated by the buoyancy raised to power one fourth. Seems like, you know, an excellent collapse. We have also verified by looking at a compensated plot that indeed the phi third scaling is robust. Now you could ask the question that, look, there is a fall off. Is it different than what you would expect if you were doing homogeneous isotropic turbulence simulation? So Vikas did something quite nice. He find, he took a Newton, I mean, just the Navier-Stokes solver, kept on changing the Reynolds number. And he found out that around RE lambda of 110, the scaling regimes and scaling ranges coincided with the largest Galilee number that we were doing. And quite remarkably, if I show you the two spectrum, you see that the you have a clear phi third scaling range. The thing with uh, polymer, sorry, bubbles decays much more slowly, whereas the homogeneous isotropic turbulence actually falls off remarkably fast. Well, I put all the thing and it's really clear, but okay. Uh, but then the question is that if that's the case, 
Why is the difference? And that we already know because at these small scales in the bubbles, the balance is a completely different thing. The surface tension acts all the way up to the smallest scales. Uh, so, you know, then one could now wonder what is the phenology of small scale turbulence in these systems and uh, whether you recover the extended, you know, the standard uh, uh, Kolmogorov uh, K61 scenario, the extended self-similarity and other things or not. So we haven't done any of that. Um, now, again, you could look at the scale by scale energy budget for the largest of the systems that we looked at. And indeed, at Galilee 2000, you find a clear flux appearing in the system. And indeed, for a range of scales, you have a, let's say, a plateau in the energy flux, which is what is expected. Now, remember, here I'm evaluating the fluxes using a Gaussian filter. If I had looked at the same thing with a spectral filter, you would have gotten a much cleaner constant region. And that's a very well known thing. Uh, and this particular plateau, I mean, because the nonlinear flux is much more dominant here, it's very clear. Therefore, in these range of scales, you would expect a phi third scaling to appear. So everything starts happening at scales, which are smaller than the bubble diameter. If I look at this plot in this early stages, the nonlinear flux dominates. Therefore, you expect a phi third scaling. After that, both surface tension and nonlinear flux together balances the viscous dissipation in the system, which leads to a scaling, which, diff which is some kind of power law. I'm not claiming that it's exactly minus three, but it's some power law which appears because of that balance. And that's how we understand. Yeah. Uh, they are not differing. No, no, no. So these are a different Galilee numbers. So imagine th this is this was motivated by the kind of plots one makes in experiments where you make Reynolds, let's say 100, 1000, 2000, 3000, and put everything together so that you can see both the ranges together clearly, right? So this is what is done over here. I have, it's not different methods. So like 1029 volume of fluid and 1029 front tracking are actually indistinguishable on this plot. So what, sorry? No, because, because the point is that for each one of them, the dissipation scale is different, right? I'm not keeping the large scale constant, right? Uh, so, all right. Uh, so with that, that brings the conclusion of the first part of, or the first thing of my talk, which is that at moderate Galilee, we indeed observe what experiments observe that the energy spectrum in these bubbly flows shows you a minus three scaling. But more interestingly, I think for experiments, it would be great if someone could do these experiments at large enough Galilee number to see whether there is a possibility to observe, at least numerical simulations indicate that there is a possibility to observe both phi third and minus three scaling together, right? And I think experiments are much more natural candidate to resolve this issue. Uh, quite interestingly, our conclusions do not depend on the density contrast. Uh, we, of course, are starting to look at the statistics of higher moments, the Lagrangian statistics of bubbles, but that's is something to be explored. So that's the first part. The second part that I want to talk about is something where, again, yeah. Uh, Lance Collins. Lance Collins. Bubbles? Lance and Batal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that okay? No, because they were assuming that the uh, energy, whatever you are injecting, is instantaneously dissipated. So there is no scale separation there. So if there is no scale separation, you are doing a balance which is like a Stokesian balance. So which is what is an important point. And the other thing is you assume that the nonlinear transfers are not important here, where what we are pointing out. Minus three in the regime where at small scales. And there also what we are pointing out is that the surface tension gives you another transfer mechanism, which is a nonlinear transfer mechanism. Yeah. Uh, so that, so then let me go to another part, which I have been working for again, quite some time, where more recently, thanks to the Herculean simulations by Marco, we are able to find out new regimes in polymeric turbulence and non-monotonic behavior, which at least to my knowledge, hasn't been observed either in experiments or numerical simulations. 
uh, the, the non-monotonic behavior plays. Uh, and these are some places where you can look at this work. Now, why we are fascinated with polymers and flows? Because they dramatically alter the flow properties. This is one of the classic pictures of a water jet, and you add polymers to it, and the flow becomes fairly regular. Again, I'm thinking of systems where the polymer concentration is very small. So this is five to 20 parts per million. What one means by parts per million? It's one milligram in one kilo of uh, whatever substance you're looking at. So you could think of five mg of polymer, you to put it in one liter of water, that gives you five ppm of uh, uh, polymer solution. Uh, the polymers, the system is so dilute that you can completely ignore polymer polymer interactions. And still you find dramatic change in flow structure. And you know, again, this is a very classic problem. So people had looked at polymers in grid turbulence where they find out that you know the energy spectrum was modified. If one adds large amount of polymers to the system, uh, it falls off steeper, at least in the inertial range. Um, more interestingly, more rather recently, the group of Bodenschatz also did experiments where you find that, that you know the small inertial range, which is over here, gets reduced when you add polymers to the system. And indeed, in our numerical simulations, we also found evidence of that, that you know, if you add polymers and increase the Weisenberg number, which is the ratio of the polymer time scale to the um, Kolmogorov time scale, the energy spectrum becomes you know, reduced at these uh, intermediate scales. But what caught our attention after at least 10 years was this recent experiments, again by the group of Eberhardt, where they found something interesting is that when you look at a polymeric system and you keep on increasing the polymer concentration, then you observe emergence of a new scaling range, which is minus 1.38. And that looks like, you know, if I look at this simulation and try to fit something, it could looks like it's becoming steeper. But you know, we didn't have the resolution then to even claim such a thing, but they had fairly convincing thing of that, oh, you have a new range emerging. And there are intermediate uh, concentrations where both the range scalings coexist. So you have, a, this is uh, this fr uh, French washing. I mean, there is a jet from so homogeneous isotropic kind of a flow at the center, but. Okay. And what was the most interesting result according to me was the following. If you plot the, structure functions, the exponents of the structure function in the inertial range. So where you see the Newtonian like behavior. So that's, <coughs> sorry, that's this particular, uh, that I think, yeah. So that's the red data. And the straight line over here is the standard Kolmogorov prediction. Then you can look at the departure of the exponent from the Kolmogorov prediction, right? That's what we always do. So what you get, the exponent is the Kolmogorov exponent plus a correction. You could do the same thing with polymer. So this is the data for the polymer in the elastic regime, which is over here. And you see that again, you have something which looks like 0.7 N and then there is a departure. The claim was that although the main exponents, which are because of the average value of the energy dissipation, have a simple scaling behavior like n by three or one plus beta n by three, the corrections that you have, right, are identical with or without polymers. They are clear, okay? And that's quite remarkable to me that look, if that's happening, that's quite impressive, right? And how did they show it? They subtracted the exponent that they get from the exponent of the Newtonian liquid and what you find is there's something which is constant. Now, one could wonder whether departures are starting to happen here or not, but within their error, no. And that's what they claim that the intermittency corrections are same, whether you are looking at the standard inner inertial turbulence or the one with polymers inside it. And then, you know, we ask ourselves the question, can we reproduce some of these results? What is it that we observe? And so that's what we started off with. And it's, uh, the idea is very simple then, because we I have uh, one, minute. one minute. Okay, that's good. So the idea is very simple. You work with standard polymer models. We use both FENEPI and Oldroyd B. The reason for this to do was the following, that both these models have one common feature, 
that they capture the elasticity of the polymer. They have one different feature that the FENAPI model has extensional viscosity inside it or shear thinning behavior, whereas Oldroyd B is not a shear thinning liquid. So we wanted to check whether the shear thinning matters or not. But what I'm the answer. So the short answer is you can use Oldroyd B or FENAPI for what I'm going to show you. Uh, but the results that I'm going to show are going to be for FENAPI. So the first interesting result, which is a new result, which is not known to the community at least, I wasn't known to me till I did, till Marco did the simulation, is that as you go on increasing the Deborah, so Deborah is a sister of Weisenberg number where you are looking at tau p, the polymer relaxation time to the large time scale of the flow. As you go on increasing the Deborah or Weisenberg number, there's something remarkable happens in flow structure. So this is homogeneous isotropic turbulence. You add polymers, looks like, you know, things are getting more regular. You increase the Deborah number further and looks like the turbulence is coming back in the system. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they are related to each other. Their ratio is like a Reynolds. So it looks like there is a non-monotonic behavior as you crank up the Deborah. Now, when we saw it, immediately the question is, I'm coming to it, right? So then you immediately, when you observe it, you immediately ask the question that, look, is the polymer extension changing? Because naively, one could, I, I, at least I used to always wonder that if I'm adding polymer to the system, the flow is getting more regular, then the polymer extension should go down after some point. And indeed, if you look at these plots, what I plotted is average trace of C versus the Deborah number. And what you start to find is that the average trace of C first increases, reaches a peak, and then starts to go down again. So that's the result which is completely non-intuitive and hasn't been observed earlier. Interestingly enough, if you switch off the coupling of the polymer to the fluid, which is what is done by many people, where one looks at the stretching of passive polymers, you won't find this behavior. The polymer keep on extending as you crank up the Deborah number. So the back reaction is crucial. Exactly. So that's first part, which is a very interesting result. The second part is here that as you go on increasing the Deborah number, so this is at Deborah 0.18, you get the phi third scaling. You crank up the Deborah further, you start to see a new scaling regime starts to appear. So this is phi third, this is minus two third, minus two third is similar to what was observed in the experiment. You crank up the Deborah further, you again go back to phi third. Okay, so there's a window where the polymer stresses start to become important. Now in view of time, let me quickly go. Those are from simulation. So these are, and here is the final result. So you could do the structure function analysis, but I think the best way to look at how intermittency is, is to look at the F alpha spectrum, right? And you plot the spectrum with or without the polymer. Actually the F alpha spectrum are on top of each other and the plus sign are the experimental data. So that, you know, I can tell you more about the details, but in view of time, that's at least a decent evidence that with or without polymer in the regime we are looking at, indeed similar to experiments, our results indicate that the intermittency corrections do not depend whether we have added polymer. I'm not saying the exponents are same. No, so this is in the intermediate case where Deborah is cross 0.95, yes. So, and so, so you know, that's an interesting result that, you know, uh, where you have both these phi third and the elastic regime. Um, indeed, the correction, I'm not saying exponents, the exponents are different, but the corrections are the same. And that to me is quite remarkable because it's telling that the average value of energy dissipation rate, although is different, the nature of fluctuations about the average is identical. And you know, to me, it's still surprising. I'm still trying to digest it, but that's what our numerical simulations suggest. Uh, so with that, I would conclude by pointing out that, you know, large is indeed different. If you keep on pushing the parameters, you indeed find something remarkable. And uh, the one thing we found out was a non monotonic behavior of polymer extension, which to the best of my knowledge, hasn't been observed earlier. And quite interestingly, similar to experiments, although the mean energy dissipation changes with or without polymer. So which means that the value of the exponent is different. The intermittency correction to the exponent seems to be identical. So yeah, with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Yes, please. Two questions. 
One question and one remark. Yes. The first question is about the first part. Yes. I mean, you should be able to check if there is this uh, real uh, balancing between dissipative uh, term, viscosity, and the buoyancy by changing uh, using hyperviscosity. Did you try? So we tried some of the things with hyperviscosity. You should change the slope, right? Instead of k to minus three, should be k to minus something. Yeah, so we tried that, but it, so you, so you could do that, but then it becomes like, unphys I mean, at some level, you see the bubbles are injecting vorticity into the fluid and how you are dissipating it. So you could do that as a trying to understand the scaling, but then it becomes far away from the experiment in the sense that you really don't know the way the bubble is generating things, whether it's similar or not, because think of the very simple thing that how the capillary fluctuations which are generated yeah, there. Allows you nevertheless to check if the balancing yes. is correct, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. The remark is, I mean, if F alpha is the same, also the exponents are the same. It's not only- No, the, no, no, no. I mean, the because exponents are, are the, the shunt transform of those. No, because, yeah, yeah, but see this. It's exactly this. So if I take two cases where one is n by three, another one is a constant. So what I'm pointing out is the following that the main scaling is coming because of the average value of the energy dissipation, right? The fluctuations, if they're identical, then corrections are the same. I mean, the, the, this is from here, Luca. One more question. So it, let's talk. Okay. If alpha is measured only the energy dissipation. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Then we direct thank the speaker again.